My name is Ken McDonald. Uh, I run the application security program at SimCore. And my, my session's a little bit different. Everybody has a happy story. My story's a bit more doom and gloom. It has a happy ending, though, so that's fine. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about myself, I've been at SimCore off and on for about 13 years. Um, I went to a few other organizations in between, but they always seemed to pull me back with all my lessons learned throughout. Like I said, uh, like mentioned, I've done uh, IAM engineering and API security throughout application security at various organizations. Um, <clears throat> so I've heard a lot of stories, customer stories today about integrating and also creating customizations within WSO2. So all I want everyone to do is fast forward 10 years and hopefully you don't remember my face because my story is about customizing a single sign-on instance and it went horribly wrong. And uh, that's kind of the premise of my, my talk. So I'm gonna just walk through the, the history of SSO at SimCore and why it's uh, pretty doom and gloom and uh, also talk about our current and like future initiatives and also our cloud and DevOps strategy as it relates to WSO2. So historically we've been using OpenSSO and we built some pretty intense customizations. I would say there's two separate use cases and they were both uh, uh, variations of, I would call them SAML, SAML-like in the SAML family. Um, so there's three different client implementations. One of the uh, use cases is very complex. Um, so this is where I, I recommend against not customizing things is five years from now, 10 years from now. It's very difficult to support. The first thing you'll see is that the, uh, you know, WSO2 might come up with 6.0 and all of your customizations, the interfaces have changed. You're, you're looking at a rewrite. And WSO2 out of the box has a lot of support for a lot of various things you would want to do. So, you know, they've tried to get us to customize more at SimCore, but I've pushed back uh, pretty hard. So the, these are the typical use cases. You know, I stole the, the images from Oasis documentation. I was too lazy to create my own. So, you know, we got the IDP initiated and the SP initiated flow, the back and forth, and the, the SAML exchange based stuff, trust. Uh, so then the more complicated use case is the federation using persisted pseudonym identifiers. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you may have used an implementation like this or at least seen an implementation like this. Can I show hands, anybody done anything like this complicated? Basically where you have a registration piece on basically both sides, you do the account linking and then you exchange the, uh, basically the ID in between. So. It would have been fine if this is all SimCore was doing. But this is what SimCore was doing. So, you know, all jokes aside, <laughs> that's how I envision it when I'm dreaming, and thus the nightmare. Um, so to go back to this slide, what, the implementation had to be customized in twofold. As it hit the application, the SAML-like implementation had to be tweaked heavily and as the back and forth happens with the IDP, there was two or three additional back and forth with customized SAML messages. So this is kind of how I, I see it. Um, the other challenge is we have a custom database where there's decisioning in the background to, to determine what service provider the application, or sort of the end user actually has to go to. Go to. So, the challenge has always been replacement. OpenSSO, they end of life it a long time ago. Um, in my experience at SimCore, we have had probably three or four failures of this project um, over eight years. Um, so the skill set and historical knowledge of that existing platform has, is, is long gone. We, I think the last resource left a year ago, two years ago. Um, we've evaluated many projects and every single one of them had to have customizations, and it was becoming very expensive. Um, so we looked at Ping, Forgerock, Tivoli, and PicketLink, um, but several of these options were far too expensive. So our first choice, PicketLink. Uh, show of hands, anyone here of PicketLink? Anyone use PicketLink? Okay. So 
it's part of the Red Hat umbrella. We had a Red Hat contract, so we tried to just utilize them. And this was actually an eight-month project gone wrong. We had them build the customization, and we got it through to like half QA tested, not 100% successful. Um, and we spent, obviously, many months. Then Red Hat slotted Picket Link as end of life in, in uh, lieu of Key Cloak, which they just had started to push forward. Those same developers that were building and helping us with Picket Link were now trying to get the initial release of Key Cloak ready. And so they did not have time to implement the changes for our customization in Key Cloak. And so we would have had to have been forced to deploy uh, an end of life, slotted for end of life instance of Picket Link. And so at this point was when my team volunteered well, I voluntold my team, we're gonna move this forward. So this is where I actually scrapped the whole project. And we went back to the drawing board. And I didn't like the decision of Picket Link. I think it was flawed. And so I said, let's bring in Gartner. Let's see what they have to say. And based on cost and all these other factors, Gartner pointed us to, again, Key Cloak, which you know I wasn't a fan of, uh, OpenAM and WSO2. So we evaluated all three. and. Uh, Every single one of them were willing to make customizations, but uh, again, this, I do not recommend this because all these technologies are built off of standards. Try to make the standards work for you. Uh, maintenance, patching, it's all quite a nightmare. So one other thing I'd like to add that WSO2, they, they did the customizations very affordably. Um, Picket link, key cloak, I think it was five times or more expensive than what WSO2 charged. Um, so my team evaluated everything from an uh, API, sorry, a w, uh, identity server perspective. And as an afterthought, architecture just kind of slipped API manager uh, into the statement of work as we uh, were rolling everything out. So then all of a sudden, my team was actually managing API manager as well as uh, identity server. So we had a lot of internal discussions and uh, I, I highly recommended that we kept our core platform that included API manager segmented away from our customized use case, which, so that's what we've done. We have two platforms, but one that just has identity, identity server with customizations and only the one client left behind on that Everyone else has moved on to the, the newer platform and under a standard use case. Um, but trust me, the, this custom implementation, even though we selected WSO2, was not without its challenges. So again, I highly recommend not <laughs> deviating from standards. Um, so at, at SimCore, they all wanted to make use of this new platform we introduced. and. Uh, we didn't really want to be in the business of managing local accounts. Uh, we're a B2B solution, a B2B company. Um, we're actually owned by all of the banks in, uh, in Canada, and we basically service their customers. So we've put a hard stop on local accounts because the, the legal implications of managing access to financial related data is, is, is too great. So, we federate with all of the banks and they're responsible for terminating their, their users on their side. Um, plus my team's lazy, we didn't wanna have people calling and say, oh, I forgot my password or whatever. So again, the news spread that we had this new platform and all of a sudden now, um, the, uh, all of the use cases started flooding in. Um, so. Every sing, single project now includes an API or, or an identity-related uh, component. So my, my team's been very busy because not only do we manage this, but we are also vet all of the applications from an application security perspective, running things through our SAST and DAST uh, penetration testing and, and so forth. So again, what, what turned from three small applications spread into be like, you know, our digital delivery channel for the future. So I just pull up this uh, reference because this is the, uh, the grant type that we've actually implemented with our clients. For some reason, the clients like SAML, they're happy with it. 
Um, you know, most new implementations would actually be OIDC. Um, so when you invoke uh, the API gateway and you're calling with SAML, it's, it's definitely not as clean of a solution as it would be just using OAuth or, or OIDC. So this implementation actually includes SAML, OIDC, OAuth, the identity server, and the API manager. So uh, we actually just went live a month ago with our first client using this, this entire uh, flow here. And <clears throat> it's, it was definitely challenging in, with dealing with their developers. And I'm sure everyone can appreciate uh, the development training and learning curve to introdu introduce these uh, authentication technologies is not always seamless. So with our, our new platform, this is essentially our high-level architecture. Uh, these are the identity providers our clients are kind of bringing forward, integrating with us. And we essentially have a big data farm with microservices that plug into this, this data and we expose everything through API Manager with uh, identity server as the key store. Um, and again, it's, they first exchange a SAML token for an OIDC ID token and an OAuth to uh, access token, and then they call their, their APIs. And then we just, we have a single page app that essentially drives their access and calls to the API gateway. So I, I had asked about uh, monitoring for, uh, a couple times today, and I've heard Splunk, I've heard Elk. Um, we actually published uh, a Splunk integration, a Splunk app. Uh, we found that once we had the API gateway and identity servers all up and running, uh, just the sheer volume of the nodes and the logs everywhere, it was very, very challenging. So we, we tied everything into, into Splunk, but the Splunk noise was, was too great. So we actually went through and created an app doing the filtering and actually parsing the logs. So we have very structured logs. I think I saw that uh, 70 downloads have been used on this, on this app. I could be making that up. You'd have to, you'd have to check. Uh, and again, we have, we have three environments, so everything times through. We have a development, UAT, and uh, a production. We, much like other people I've heard, we're going to create a new development, uh, a new dev environment that we test WUM updates just to pr ensure we're not breaking our development environment. For some reason, our development environment is just as popular as our production environment. Because this, if we even shut it down, we have developers screaming throughout the company. It's, they'll call me after hours. I'm like, we're not on call for the dev environment. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I was tasked with trying to propose how we could deploy this in a continuous deployment, continuous integration approach using AWS. So I have a couple of approaches that I've, I've been through, and I've worked on this with my team. <clears throat> so the first approach, so we, we purchased GitLab, which has a CI CD uh, component. Um, it's YAML based. It's very similar to probably Drone by GitHub or you know, Circle CI. So we invoke this, we call uh, WUM, we pull down the updates. And then we use Packer. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with HashiCorp's Packer. But we take the WUM updates, and we essentially package an AMI image for AWS. Um, we then store this image to be then used as part of the deployment after the fact. And we do the same for identity server and the gateway and store publisher. The challenge with store publisher is you can't create one server instance and just auto scale it because you have references to like an MQ server so that they can point to each other. So that just needed a little bit of crafting from a deployment uh, perspective. So the next step to the deployment was we used Terraform. So once the image is created in Amazon, we then use Terraform to build the auto scaling groups, the Amazon RDS instance, the, uh, everything's an internal reference to a, a private hosted zone. Um, so yeah, I wanted to actually leverage as much as I could of the cloud because the one thing I would, I would say is that the, 
the size of the infrastructure and managing the infrastructure is something that we, we would like to do less of. Um, so not having to patch our database service servers, which is what Amazon RDS would allow for us to do. So next, after talking with Pravath, uh, I believe we started looking at Kubernetes deployment. So here, here I have a link to the pattern uh, under their WSO2 GitHub. And uh, it's actually, there's some really good documentation to follow along and actually deploy to Google's Kubernetes. Um, and I, I just followed it step by step. Um, the challenge, of course, you'll be dealing with is how do you protect credentials? And how do you uh, store secrets? So our whole, our whole environment is under the scope of PCI, or at least right now we're going through the, the assessment for PCI. And this is bringing the challenges of you can't have st stored passwords. Um, everything has to be either so encrypted. It's a secondary system, so um, you can't have even termination of HTTP uh, past your load balancer. So there's just, there's a, that's actually the easy part for WSO2 because I found it harder to actually uh, serve everything over HTTP. So, so after deploying to Google's Kubernetes, um, I realized that I, I would prefer a managed Kubernetes service. Um, so Amazon just released their EKS. I'm not sure if anyone's been following that. And as much as I'm talking about Amazon right now, I don't know if you've been following the news throughout the day. Their Amazon Prime Day has been an epic fail. They, most of it's offline, and so I hope, <laughs> I really hope they're not using their own infrastructure. <laughs> and so, uh, in deploying the Kubernetes uh, stack with Amazon, um, there's there's a couple pieces that Amazon uh, does have to make things a little easier. Uh, EFS is an elastic file service, so it's their NFS server. And so pa uh, storing and sharing the uh, XML for the APIs, uh, that's how we distribute that across all of the nodes. Um, yeah, it was definitely an interesting learning experience to get the, the actual pattern that was available online deployed in this, in this fashion. And it is up and running right now for development, but this only becomes a repeatable deployment model if we can push it all the way to production. And because of our owners being in the financial space, they're, they're a bit more uh, against the cloud, especially in, in Canada. So they're not as willing to move at this point. So we have a lot of legal restrictions and privacy restrictions. And so we have to go ask for consent from all of our clients to be able to use the cloud. So that's kind of our next steps. Here's just a little more detailed diagram showing the, uh, the load balancers and the, the NFS. And uh, one thing I'd also like to mention is the beauty of Amazon is that you can use S3 buckets and assume a role under uh, your EC2 instances and only provide access to those instances, or sorry, that IAM role to have access to credentials stored in S3. So, that would actually uh, be acceptable for a PCI uh, requirement. So that's basically all I had. I was hoping that there might be some questions just because I, I am kind of saying that don't, don't customize anything, and that's what I've been hearing all day is everyone customizing. Um, So I think you're talking about WSA2 identity server within Kubernetes, I, Docker, it, I guess. It's, it's every, the whole stack. Whole. So this is what my question is. Like normally WSA2 servers are like shared component, right? Are, uh, sorry, they're like shared. Like WSA2 servers are shared component, like whatever server, I mean API gateways or um, identity server. So now putting it inside a container, which is supposed to be cater towards microservices, autonomous services. How, I mean, how does it working for you? Because I believe that your containers now is gonna be gigantic, right? 
Yeah. It's not going to be a small container of a couple of hundreds, a couple of megs. It's going to be in gigabytes. At yeah, least the, this the container is actually pretty large that comes from WS2. So WS2 actually supports and packages their own Docker instance for Kubernetes, and that's the one we actually deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it looks like it's leveraging the Ubuntu image, which is a larger Docker image. One thing I did notice, I had to create my Kubernetes nodes to be larger to be able to support because there's basically the gateway, the store publisher, the identity server, and then times two for the load balancing, or times three so that it can be replicated across the high availability portion. So, so any particular reason why you want to use um, Dockerized and like containers rather than a VM? So this was an exercise of showing it could be done. So our development is going through the whole, we want to do DevOps, but no one really understands DevOps. So we're just showing that you can introduce the capability with, with Dockers. And the whole point is I want to be able to create the environment, blow it away, and create it again, and nothing would be lost. Okay, so this is more, mostly because of CICD point of view. What? Yes. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thanks.